Jesus said, those who love me will keep my way, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Alleluia. gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. those 
five little loaves and the two fish. Not really even enough for the twelve disciples and for Jesus. They are notorious for forgetting to bring bread, at least in Mark's gospel. So how are 5,000 men, plus women and children, to be fed? Inadequate resources doesn't even quite reach it. But discipleship is not, or at least not just, a matter of managing scarce resources. Discipleship is bringing what you have to Jesus. Jesus says, bring them here to me, those loaves and those fish. And as he will do at the Last Supper, he takes and blesses and breaks and gives the food to his disciples who then give it to the crowds and everyone eats and is satisfied and the disciples have to bust the tables and pick up the leftovers. Jesus feeds the hungry. Jesus turns scarcity into abundance. It's a miracle. We're not comfortable with miracles. We live in a world governed by cause and effect in which everything can be explained if you just look at it hard enough. Miracles are impossible. And when something shows up that seems like it might be outside of the, the understanding, the cause and effect, the tracing back what is to what made it happen, what we nowadays cleverly call the narrative, then we just make whatever it is fit the narrative. Jesus fed the hungry. So the church should be out building soup kitchens. If Jesus fed the hungry, then so should you, and that's what it's all about. Jesus turned scarcity into abundance. So if you don't have enough, you should, you should name and claim that blessing, the prosperity gospel, God as vending machine. It's another narrative. Or my favorite, the favorite one of all, Jesus shamed the people who actually had plenty of food themselves. He shamed them into sharing it, and that was the miracle. Guilt as motivator. <laughs> no, no, it's none of these. It's a miracle. Now, the world is orderly. The world is governed by the natural laws placed to govern it by nature's God, by God the Creator. But the world is not a closed system, wherein every effect can be traced back to its cause. Because God is actively involved in the world, in time, in history, in our lives. He miraculously delivered Israel out of Egypt. He gave them the law on Mount Sinai. He gave them the, the covenant of his sure, steadfast love. He gave them the promises that end up with the Messiah, the Christ. And in Jesus, the miracle of the Word made flesh, God's kingdom draws near. And Jesus works miracles. Is not this miracle in some sense an active miracle of the kingdom? The seed grain of a tiny gift to Jesus turns into an abundant harvest and feast. But we're not comfortable with miracles. We want to we want to have something to do with it. 
We can't have it be all God's will. And perhaps the, the willingness of Jesus to receive the five loaves and two fish is designed to sort of accommodate us in this our desire. What we bring to Jesus is blessed. Whatever that tiny gift may be, the widow's two copper pennies are blessed. What we bring to Jesus is broken, like those loaves of bread. It is that which is broken that can feed men. And it's our self-centeredness, our pride, our feeling that we're in control, that we can explain everything. That has to be broken so that we can be open to the way that God moves in the world, in time, in history, in our lives. Because he does, you know. Whatever we bring to Jesus, skill with hands or words, artistic talents, money, Time, a willingness to serve, love. Whatever we bring to him, how matter, how matter how small it is, he will take it. Bless it, break it, and give it back to us to share. That is finding life by losing it. What we give to Jesus, we give back so that we can give it to others. That's following Jesus, the one whose body is broken on the cross, so that God can work his greatest miracle. The Father raising Jesus from the dead in the power of the Spirit, so that he might be the bread of life forever. And we remember the power of Jesus' cross and resurrection when we enter into the weekly miracle of the Eucharist, where bread and wine become, quite miraculously, his body and blood. He is able to feed us with the gift of himself. And this is no meager seed grain of the kingdom sown into our lives. This is the food that really satisfied. It's the richest food Isaiah could possibly imagine. It's God's providence brought to a point. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hands and satisfy the needs of every living creature. God's providence pervades the world, but it comes to a point when we again repeat Jesus' actions and words as he takes and blesses and breaks and gives us the bread that becomes his body and this feast of his resurrection informs our lives. What miracle may you experience this week because you have come here to this feast today? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.